what we've seen in a lot of the reactions that we just looked at is an example of what we call oxidation. When a chemical species loses electrons, we call that kind of change an oxidation. Here's a couple examples. Sodium, when it ionizes, it's doing an oxidation. It becomes a one plus ion. It loses its dot, if you recall from earlier in the year. And it's going to give up an electron, because that's what that dot is in Lewis dot notation. Or calcium. Calcium becomes a two plus ion, like all column twos. And that means it's going to have to give up two electrons. Those are examples of what we call oxidation. When a chemical species gains electrons, we call that change a reduction. Here's an example, Cl2, chlorine. It can gain two electrons and make two chloride ions. That's a gain of electrons. Or another example, sulfur. Sulfur also gains two electrons, and now it becomes an S2-. Those are examples of reductions. Now, you can't create or destroy electrons. And so when you give up some electrons in an oxidation and you gain some electrons in a reduction, well, those electrons have to come from someplace and go to someplace. So what that means is they happen in pairs. Reduction and oxidation can't happen separately. So we call the reactions in which those occur redox, which is short for reduction slash oxidation. So let's look at one of our previous examples. We had sodium oxidizing to Na plus and giving up an electron. We also had chlorine gaining two electrons to become chloride, two chloride ions. Well, if two sodiums made two sodium ions and gave up two electrons, this would be a pretty good match. The two electrons given up by the sodiums matches the two electrons that have to be gained by the chlorine. So here's the overall reaction. You sort of add these reactions up. Two NAs react with the Cl2 and give us two NaCls. This is a redox. An oxidation is happening to the sodium. A reduction is happening to the chlorine at the same time. Well, it's not always so easy to spot. Electrons are being lost or gained. And so we have another way of telling. When a species is oxidized, there's an increase in oxidation number. Remember, we learned earlier how to assign oxidation numbers. This is why. So we can spot oxidations and reductions. Because when a species is reduced, you're going to see a decrease in oxidation number. So let's look at the example that we just saw. Sodium and chlorine making NaCl. This is how it was balanced. Well, uncombined elements have oxidation numbers of zero. So for both the sodium and the chlorine, initially the oxidation number is zero. In this ionic compound, sodium is a one plus, so that's its oxidation number, and chloride is a one minus ion, so that's its oxidation number. Well, here we see an increase in oxidation number. That's the oxidation. We knew that was an oxidation because we saw electrons being lost. From zero to one minus, is a decrease in oxidation number. So that is a reduction. And we knew that chlorine was being reduced because it's gaining electrons. Here's another example that involves a molecule, not an ionic compound. Hydrogen and chlorine are both uncombined elements. So on the left-hand side, their oxidation numbers are zero. Over here, this is a compound. In compounds, hydrogen is almost always one plus. Well, that forces the chlorine to be minus one. Again, we see a reduction oxidation reaction must have taken place, a redox, because O increases in oxidation number, that's an oxidation, and chlorine decreases in oxidation number, that is a reduction. Lots of single replacement reactions and synthesis reactions and combustion reactions are redox reactions. And so you can spot those, you can tell if they really are or not, by just tracking the oxidation numbers. Sometimes, when a metal is put in the presence of a compound that has a different metal, a redox reaction occurs. Like here's an example. If I take aluminum and I put it in Fe2O3, it takes a little while to get this started, but this reaction occurs and it occurs very violently. Aluminum will replace the iron. I'll get Al2O3 and the iron will be by itself. And in fact, it produces so much energy that the iron ends up melting. This reaction always happens every time. Sometimes, however, I can put a metal in a compound that contains a different metal and nothing happens. Here's an example of that. 
if I take copper and I combine it with zinc sulfate, ZnSO4, what happens is no reaction. Why would that be? It turns out that some metals are just better at displacing other metals. A way we measure the metal's displacing ability is through what we call activity. The more active a metal is, the better it is at displacing other metals. You can find very large activity series, these are called, that organize these things in order of increasing activity. But this is an abbreviated version that has just a few metals on it. You can see on this list that we have, gold is the least active of all metals, and zinc in this list is the most active of all metals. The more to this side a metal is, the more active it is. In other words, the more likely it is to be part of a compound, to displace another metal in a compound. The farther it is to this side of the list, the less likely it is to be part of a compound, and the more likely it is to be by itself. Things like gold and platinum and silver you find on this end of the chain, we value them precisely because they're not very active. They don't react too well. So using the activity series to make predictions, if you take a look at this combination, copper is located here, gold is located over here. This means gold is less likely to be part of a compound, more likely to be by itself. Copper is less likely to be by itself than gold, more likely to be part of a compound. So this is a reaction that's going to occur. Copper is going to displace that gold. So I'll end up with copper, probably two nitrate, CuNO32, and gold will be by itself. I'm not worrying about balancing right now. Take a look at this combination. Here's copper. Here's zinc. Now when I compare copper with zinc, copper is much less active, so therefore less likely to be part of a compound. Zinc is more likely to be part of a compound, and it already is, so nothing's going to happen. This is a no reaction. Now the activity series can get really complicated, and I don't expect you to memorize the whole thing. It turns out that there's a, a simplification that can cover most everything that you're going to have to discover in this class. And here's how the simplification works. If I think about just a few expensive metals, gold would be one, silver, platinum, copper, and then there's a fifth one that shows up too, and that's mercury. Those things are less active than hydrogen, which isn't a metal at all, but that's a, an important boundary for reasons that we'll discuss later. Then I can think about all the other metals as being more active. So this kind of dividing line is going to help us make lots of choices between will a reaction happen or not. Expensive metals don't usually react if they're by themselves. Cheap metals generally do. There's a whole class of redox reactions that involve oxygen. In fact, the original oxidation was when oxygen was combined with something. In a combustion reaction, these are called combustion reactions, oxygen is added to a species to create at least one oxide and possibly more. So here's an example. If I take sulfur and I react it with oxygen, I will get SO2. That's an oxidation for the sulfur. It's a reduction for the oxygen. Same thing with carbon. If I take charcoal and I burn it in air, my product is going to be CO2, an oxide of carbon. When I burn methane, I'm oxidizing two things at once. I create an oxide of carbon, which is CO2, and I create an oxide of hydrogen, which is water. You try this one. Predict the products. And why don't you go ahead and try and balance it, too? Well, here's your answer. I can't oxidize oxygen, but I can oxidize carbon and hydrogen. I saw from the previous example, when I oxidize carbon, I get CO2. When I oxidize hydrogen, I get H2O. Now, let's balance this. I've got six carbons here. I'm going to balance carbon first because all the carbon in the reaction shows up in CO2, so that should be easy. I'll just put a six here. Next, I'm going to balance the hydrogen, and I'm going to do that because all the hydrogen in the product side shows up in water. Well, I've got 12 H's on the left, so if I put a six in front of water, i got 12 H's on the right. Now I'm going to count up the O's and take care of that. Six times two is 12. Plus another 6 gives me 18 O's on the right-hand side. Well, on the left-hand side, I have 6 O's plus another 2. Well, 6 and 12 would be 18, so putting a 6 there will balance my equation. 
This is a pretty good strategy for balancing combustion reactions like this. This is a real common pattern. You have something that has carbon, hydrogen, and maybe oxygen in it, or maybe it's just carbon and hydrogen. Reacts with oxygen gives you CO2 and H2O. Typical products of the combustion. When you're balancing these, go with carbon and hydrogen first, then take care of oxygen at the end.